We're going to be looking today at uh, Mission 2017, and uh, as we uh, begin this uh, new year, we're going to uh, think in terms of what, where we want to head and where we want to go. And we're looking out of uh, Luke uh, chapter 4, verses 14 uh, through 21. And we have an insert uh, for today's message. We encourage you to uh, be sure to check that out as we go along in this passage of Scripture this morning. Now, many of you probably already made New Year's resolutions, and some of you have already failed. You had high expectations, didn't you? And uh, now you, you realize, well, I may not achieve those after all. And so you get frustrated. And uh, frustration is, is a function of our expectations. We uh, often have high expectations, and when we can't achieve those expectations, we begin to get irritated, we begin to get aggravated, we get frustrated. And uh, it begins to become a burden to us if we dwell on it too much. Parents have expectations of their children. And children will be guaranteed to disappoint you. Uh, we have expectations of keeping to a diet. And if you're like me, you, you can just be guaranteed you're probably not going to keep it. Okay? And we get frustrated. We wonder, why are we doing this? Why, why are these things happening? And sometimes we have expectations about what we expect in life and from other people, from our church, from our family, and from our work positions. And when those things don't happen, we become very frustrated. And as a result of that, we begin to maybe get negative, maybe get bitter, maybe decide it's just not worth making expectations and having dreams and so on. But uh, that's not the case. And, and I'll tell you why. Because God has designed us in such a way to dream big dreams and to accomplish what he calls us to do. You see, uh, all these things about frustration apply to work and family and church, government, individual relationships, our personal self. All of us experience those frustrations. But Jesus, if you read the New Testament, read the Gospels, Jesus operated without a sense of frustration, didn't he? Je Jesus didn't seem to have that. He, he knew who he was where he was going, and what he had to accomplish. And the disciples many times said, what? We're going to Jerusalem. What? Why are we going there? Why are you talking to this woman? What? And they didn't understand. But Jesus always knew what he was doing and where he was going, and he had a sense of uh, direction in his life. You see, he had core values that nurtured his vision for life. And all of us have values. Sometimes they're unexamined values, but all of us have values that guide our thinking in life. And as we begin to nurture those values, we begin to see that, that these values direct us in a certain way. They lead us along a certain path. Now, you can have values that are not good, and you can have values that are good. But uh, those values will put you on a path in, in a certain direction. So it's very important that we check our values, what, what we believe what guides and sustains us, and then what directs us and guides us in the way in which we should go. Jesus knew his values, and he nurtured his vision for life. In other words, he had a mission. He had purpose in life to accomplish his vision. He knew what he was going to do with his life. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, that a sense of purpose or mission will serve as a compass to keep you headed in the right direction. We have to have a sense of purpose or mission to guide us, to, to be the North Star, to be a compass that points us in the right direction. And once we get those values, once we get our mission, and then it leads us to a vision, we can always stay on the right path and always head in the right direction. And if we get off the path, the compass will show us you're not following the North Star anymore. And we'll have to redirect back to where we need to be going. So we need this sense of purpose or mission to guide us in our daily walk. And so today we're going to explore Jesus' mission, and then we'll envision our mission as a church in 2017. And we find a Jesus' mission statement in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. And we hope that you'll look at this passage as we read it. 
Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at Mission 2017, our prayer is that like Jesus, we'll have a mission statement. We'll know the direction we're going and how we're going to accomplish that vision you've laid on our heart. And so help us, Father, to understand Jesus' purpose, his mission, his vision for life, and then help us to apply it to our own lives personally and as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to uh, start out by saying, as we look at this passage, that God has a vision and a mission for your life. God has a vision and a mission for your life. Now, each one of us needs to uh, come to understand that that's just a basic fact. You may not even be aware of your vision and your mission because you never thought about it. That's why we're going through this passage today to get you thinking in those terms. But God has a vision and a mission for your life, and he wants you to discover it and to follow it. Um, with those of you that used to share the four spiritual laws, one of the first things that's stated in that is that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Remember that? And that's exactly what we're talking about here. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. He has a vision and a mission for your life. And if you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, a believer in the Lord, then you have a mission that he has laid before you. So let's talk about this vision and this mission. You see, vision is the overriding purpose or objective you want to achieve over time. It's the overall purpose or objective that you want to achieve or accomplish. You see it out there in the future. That's where you want to end up. And so that's your destination. That's your goal. That's what you're aiming for. And vision then inspires and guides every decision you make as a person or an organization. Now, you can think of different organizations and you can ask yourself, you know, what is their vision? What do they want to do? Well, you go to North Florida Regional Hospital, they have their vision statement laid right out there. And, and the best thing they say about that vision statement is, we want to serve our community and provide the best possible care for our community. And there's other organizations that have vision statements and it guides their thinking. It guides the way they operate. It guides what they do. Everything applies toward reaching that vision, that long-term idea of where their organization needs to be. Well, people can have vision statements also that inspire them and, and guide them and direct them in their personal life. And those visions will in, inspire and guide your decision-making as a person as well. So Parkview's vision statement, if you read our bylaws, is to lift up Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and to obey his great commission. Now, if you receive our monthly newsletter, on the back of that newsletter, you will see that this is written on the back. I think you have a copy right here. It's right where the label for your address is and your name, and it has on there your vision statement or mission statement, as we say here. The mission of Parkview Baptist Church is to lift up Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and to obey his great commission. Now that's what we as a church say is important to us. That's where we're headed. It, it, everything we do is to lift up Jesus Christ and then to obey his great commission, which is to go and make disciples and to baptize them and to teach them and to discover that Jesus is with us wherever we go. All of that's involved in the Great Commission. And we as a church say that's why we exist. That's what we want to do as a church. And so you can have a vision statement for your life too. You have direction and purpose, what you want to accomplish 
in your life. So let's ask ourselves a question. What are some possible vision statements that Jesus might have had? What was Jesus' overall vision? Well, there's some possible answers. As we read through the New Testament and we read through the Gospels, Jesus said several things about why he had come. One of those was that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so he uses the imagery of a shepherd out looking for the lost sheep. And he says, this is why I've come. This this is my vision in life. This is what drives me each and every morning when I get up. I want to seek and to save the lost. And so everything he did in life was geared toward that. It wasn't geared toward building, building a villa down in Panama and have a nice little comfortable retirement. That wasn't his vision. No, his vision was to seek and to save the lost. That's what drove him each and every day. Or you might say John 10.10, where it says, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. This is a a same idea of seeking and saving the lost. But the idea here is, is that when I discover them, when I find them, I want to make sure they have abundant living. I want to make sure their life is lived to the full. That's what I'm going to give myself to do. I came that they might have that kind of life. I want them to fulfill God's purpose for their lives. I want them to understand why the Creator created them in the first place. I want them to understand why they are especially unique to this universe. That they're not just one out of many billions that have been born. That they have a unique, personal design that God made for them to discover. I want them to discover that. I want them to live life abundantly. That was Jesus' vision for us. And then you just pull it all down when uh, you remember Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, And Jesus said, God gave you that, Peter. And on that statement, that I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, I will build my church. And so one of his visions was to establish a family of God that would follow him and proclaim the good news that he was the Messiah. So all of these are some possible vision statements that Jesus had. And they're pretty much uh, directed in the, in the same way, aren't they? They pretty much say the same thing. That Jesus came to save people from their sins, came as Savior, and then he came as Lord. He wants to rule over them, to be their master and their guide. He wants to be the one that gives them life. He wants to be the one that helps them to live abundantly. He wants to be the one that puts them into a family that can support one another and also honor and follow him. All of that is Jesus' vision, and he accomplished that vision through his uh, life, death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus had a sense of purpose or mission that fulfilled his vision and guided his ministry. Everything he did was guided by that. He didn't didn't have any... uh, Uh, tangents going off in another direction. No, he had one purpose in mind, and he followed it. That's why when we read this passage in Luke chapter 4, remember Jesus had come back to his hometown. And as he was there, they they said, as they did often, they invited uh, the guest up to read the scripture and then to make commentary on it. And so Jesus read from Isaiah in the synagogue. Now, it's debated whether he actually turned there himself, or it happened to be the actual uh, liturgical reading for that uh, Sabbath. They don't know exactly, but it happened to be this passage from Isaiah that Jesus read from. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now I've underlined what Jesus saw as his mission. He had an overall goal of seeking and saving the lost, but notice that there's some specifics about that. How was he going to accomplish that? What what was he going to do in order to accomplish his overall vision? Well, one thing was he was going to preach good news to the poor. Now this doesn't mean people that are living in poverty, that's included, but it also means people who are poor in spirit. Remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Remember that? Jesus came to speak to those who were spiritually in poverty as well as physically 
in poverty. And he preached the good news. What is the good news? It said he's the Savior, he's the Messiah, and you need to believe in him and follow him. And then he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. He, he wanted to set people free from their prisons. Not only those that were in actual prisons, uh, and that we still have jail ministries going on today, but also he wanted to set people from the prisons that they had established for themselves. Prisons to lust of the flesh, prisons to greed, prisons to uh, conflict, prisons to ambition. Constructs they had made for themselves that ended up controlling them. And he wants to set people free from that. And also he said recovery of sight for the blind. He did actual healing of the blind during his ministry. But also he said, I want to re help people who are spiritually blind to see again. And Jesus put that as one of his missions, to get people to have spiritual insight in, into what God wants for their lives. And he continues that idea, to release the oppressed, those who are under oppression and depression and all the, the things that bear people down. He wanted to set people free from those burdens. Remember, he said, uh, come to me, all you who are labor, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. He wanted to set people free from that oppression in their lives. And then he wanted to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And this is just another term that talks about jubilee. We'll talk about jubilee a little bit later in this message. But the idea was that every seven years, there was to be a jubilee that was a, a sabbatical that would set people free from all of their debts and so on. And then every 49th, 50th year, they would uh, be set free completely from any kind of slavery, any kind of debt they had, and they could go back to their homeland, their home property, and start all over again, a fresh, clean slate. And Jesus said, I came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you know what? That favor is still going on today. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, Jesus had this sense of purpose or mission. This guided him so he knew exactly what he wanted to do. And he did all of these things in his short three-year ministry here on this earth. But also, individuals need a sense of mission in life, don't we? All of us need to understand why we exist, why we breathe, why we get up in the morning. You ever wondered that? You get up in the morning, you go, what am I doing? Well, you're asking the question, what's my mission in life? Why am I here? Why do I exist? Why did God made, make me? Why, why do I breathe? Well, all of us need that sense of mission. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The, the basic things we can do, thing we can do with our life is to follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior because he's the way. There's no other path to follow. He's the truth. There's no other truth that we can follow. He's the life. He's the one that gives me spiritual life as well as physical breath. And so putting your life centered around Jesus is a great way to get a sense of mission in life because you're asking yourself not why am I here, but Lord, what do you have planned for my life? What's my mission? Why do I exist here on this earth? Why did you give me the opportunity to be part of what you're doing in this universe? Well, individuals have that sense of mission, but also organizations need a sense of mission too. And that would include big organizations, includes churches as well. Now, Parkview, we build our mission around the five basic purposes of the church found in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. The Great Commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. If you're taking class 101, we go over this at length and, and how we come up with the five basic purposes of the church. But it comes out of these two passages, the one that talks about the Great Commission in Matthew and the one that talks about the Great Commandment there in Matthew 22. And, and out of those two uh, mandates that Jesus gave to us, we come up with the five basic purposes of the church. And, and uh, we uh, tell those in our newsletter each and every month, right under our mission statement, we, we list our purpose statement, why we exist as a church. The purpose of Parkview Baptist Church is raising the family of Jesus Christ by leading every member to 
And then we list all the five basic purposes of the church and what we want to do and accomplish as a congregation. So it's good to review those things and understand what, why we do what we do. Okay? Because there's all kinds of people with all kinds of ideas that come in and try to tell you, you should be doing this. And we're especially getting it today where people are trying to rethink church, they say. Well, we don't have to rethink church. Jesus already gave us what the church is. We're to love and we're to serve. And he gave us the, what we're supposed to do in those five basic purposes. So what are they? These purposes are worship, evangelism, discipleship, fellowship, and ministry. And that's a sign of a healthy church. When you're actively doing all these things, then you're a healthy church. It's not about how many people come to your church. It's not about how many programs your church has. It's about whether or not you're doing what God told us to do as his people. Jesus said, I will build my church. For what reason? Right there, those five reasons. So you can worship together, come corporately together to worship as God's people, to evangelize, to share the good news with other people, look for opportunities, learn how to do that. As, as uh, Mario shared in his testimony, when his <coughs> cousin asked him, you know, <coughs> excuse me, what does that mean to follow Jesus? Mario had trouble sharing that. Well, you come to church to learn how you can share the good news, to evangelize. Discipleship is, is coming to a place where you become a better follower of Jesus Christ. <coughs> One moment. I forgot my water. <clears throat> and discipleship is involved in learning how to become a follower of Jesus Christ. That's where small groups take place. That's where we study God's word. That's where we think about the skills that are necessary to live the Christian life. And so it's important to have overall worship. It's also important to gather with other believers to learn how to follow Jesus. Fellowship is included in that, where we support one another and encourage one another. But it also means making disciples and bringing them in to the fellowship of the church so they can become part of the family of God. And then ministry, is another word for that is service and doing what God has called us to do, discovering our spiritual gifts and then fulfilling uh, that purpose that God has given to each and every one of us. And so God has, has a vision and a mission for your life. He has a vision and mission for our church. So we need to be thinking about what is that for us personally and as a church each and every year we meet? Now, the Holy Spirit also empowers you for service. It's not just that God says, do these things. He also says, I am with you. That's what Christmas is all about. Emmanuel, God is with us. He has come in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus uh, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. And then he arose and went into, uh, ascended into heaven to his father. And then what did he do? He poured out his spirit on the church. So he still lives among us and he lives within us. And so now we have the Holy Spirit to empower us to do the work of ministry, to do what God has called us to do, to fulfill the mission he has called us to. Now Jesus uh, is our example in this. Notice that Jesus was led and empowered by the Spirit at his baptism, when he was tempted, and then when he began his service, his ministry. Uh, that's what we read there in verses 14 through 18 in uh, Luke. It said, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Why did he return to Galilee in the power of the Spirit? Because you remember, John had baptized him. And what happened at Jesus' baptism? It says the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, right? And God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit was anointing Jesus at his baptism to go out and do the ministry God had given to him. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. You are baptized into the Holy Spirit, and he comes and lives inside of you. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. How does that happen? The Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. 
and makes you a new creation, a new person from the inside out. And so you have the Holy Spirit within, just like Jesus was anointed there at his baptism. And then you remember what happened. It says the Spirit immediately sent him out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. You say, why would the Holy Spirit want us to be tempted of the devil? Because spiritual conflict enables us to depend on God like we've never depended before, and we grow. Just like pushing that uh, weight builds your muscles. When you have conflict and resist the devil and learn to overcome temptation, it builds your spiritual muscles. And so the Holy Spirit sent Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus was tempted of the devil, and he resisted the devil, and the devil left him for a season. Jesus was empowered by the Spirit to resist sin and temptation. And then notice that he came to do the work of ministry. Jesus began to serve. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. Why? Because he was going everywhere and healing people and, and uh, teaching, and, and people were going, who is this guy? And then it says, he taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Well, he comes back to his hometown, and that's when he sits down and reads these words, and they say, how can you do all these things? We know your mom and dad. We know your brothers and sisters. What makes you so special? And Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. You see, the thing that separated him from everybody else was the Holy Spirit. And so we need to understand that Jesus was empowered by the Spirit at his baptism, at his temptation, and in his service. Well, you see, the th same thing applies to each and every one of us. You serve best when guided by the Spirit and use your spiritual gifts in ministry. We need to follow the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. Romans 8.14 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. When, you, when the Holy Spirit resides in you, he, he has plans for you. He wants to direct your life. And if you're listening and you're spending time with God in prayer and study of God's word, God's spirit will begin to talk to you and he'll speak to you and he'll put ideas in your mind and in your thoughts. And he'll begin to say, hey, you need to, you need to drop that habit. Hey, you need, to, you need to get away from that relationship. Hey, you need to start in this direction with your life. The Holy Spirit leads you. He guides you. He directs you as you follow him. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Holy Spirit not only lives in you, but he has given to you a spiritual gift. And for some people, he's given more than one spiritual gift. But the Holy Spirit has given to you at least one spiritual gift that you can use for the common good. What's that mean? It means to edify, to build up, to help others to serve. And so that's why you have this spiritual gift. So we need to be listening to the Spirit, discovering what our spiritual gift is, and then begin to use it in service in God's community, in God's church, and in the world around us. As we do that, we begin to discover what God's purpose is for each and every one of us. So God has a vision and mission, and then he gives you the power to do what he's called you to do. And so, so this is the invitation today. Jesus invites you and me to complete his mission. Jesus invites each one of us to complete his mission. He wants us to do what he's called us to do. And that means we're going to have to be thinking and listening and discovering what God wants us to do with our lives personally and as a church. And, and that goes back to this whole concept of jubilee. You see, Jesus proclaimed the year of jubilee in his mission statement. He said, I came to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He came to set the people free. Now, what was Jubilee? Jubilee announced deliverance from debt, liberty from slavery, and rest for the land. It was a time of restoration. It was a time of holiness. It was a time of total dependence on God. You see, the way God established Israel was each family, each clan had certain territory, and each family had a plot. It was their land for life. No one could take it away. 
But as Israel went into exile and they came back and they had kings, all that stuff disappeared. And so by the time Jesus comes around, uh, the whole concept of Jubilee was very confused. And, and the idea that uh, people had to give up their land, well, the, the rich uh, landowners didn't like that idea. I'm not going to give up my land. I took this land. And so the whole system under Israel had been messed up. But Jesus comes along and says, no, I'm going to come and restore Jubilee. I'm going to set the people free. And so it was a time of great restoration, a time of holiness, a time of complete dependence on God, because the people were again going to be restored to a right relationship with God. Now, Verses 18 and 19 say it this way. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that's what he wants us to do. You see, we still live in the year of the Lord's favor. He set us free. When you come to Christ, you, you are a slave to sin. When you come to Christ, you, you've been controlled by the world. When you come to Christ, you're in spiritual poverty. But once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, something happens. You are set free from your sin. You, you are forgiven of your sin. You are restored to a right relationship with God. And he gives you purpose and meaning for your life. That's the year of the Lord's favor. And so all who receive Jesus as Lord and Savior are now under God's grace and under his liberty and freedom. This is the favorable year of the Lord. This is the time that God has given to each one of us. So we need to proclaim that. We need to proclaim liberty to people in need and preach the good news and make disciples. That's what God's mission is for each and every one of us, to proclaim liberty, to preach the good news, make disciples. Just like Mario didn't have all the answers, but he shared what he could. And later his cousin became a Christian as a result of that witness. That's what we need to do. Proclaim liberty to people. Tell them what, who Jesus is and what he did for us. And, and then allow them to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior as well. 2 Corinthians 6 says it this way. Paul's thinking of this idea of jubilee. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. He says, look, don't receive God's grace in vain. God didn't save you just so you could sit and soak. God saved you so you could serve. God saved you so you could share his grace with others. You could tell the good news of Jesus with other people. Because today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not yesterday, right now is the day of salvation. And so now is the time we proclaim the good news. And people come to know Jesus as Lord and as Savior. That's what we're talking about this morning. Proclaiming the year of God's favor. And we're going to do that this year as Parkview Baptist Church. That's why we came up with this idea of Mission 2017. You have in your bulletin that uh, insert that talks about Mission 2017. It's a green, lime green um, sheet there. And as Ann says, if we see this lime green, that has to do with grow outreach, right? Well, it does have to do with grow. It has to do with, with uh, what God wants us to do as a church. Notice what mission 2017 is. Mission 2017 will guide us to complete God's purposes for his church at Parkview Baptist Church. And we try every year to come up with with a, a new mission for the church, a new goal. Last year it was to, to love the word, learn the word and love the word and live it out, right? And we did that. And, and this year we have another mission. Notice what the mission is. Our statement is this. Mission 2017 is making a difference. Making a difference in our world. What is the purpose of fulfilled? We have the five basic purposes of the church. Well, this year we're going to focus on service in ministry. We're going to focus on service and ministry. That's one of the five basic purposes of the church. And here's the verse 
that kind of guides our thinking as we think about how we're going to serve the Lord as God's church. This comes from the Galatians 6, 9 through 10. It's all about making a difference. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, I elaborated on this quite extensively Wednesday night, but, but just briefly, notice it says, do not grow weary of doing good. It's easy to become frustrated. It's easy to think our expectations won't be fulfilled. It's easy to get weary in doing good. It's easy to give up. But notice what it says. Don't grow weary of doing good. No, we can't allow that. Because if we continue in due season, we will reap. There's going to be a harvest that comes from our service and our work that we do if we do not give up. So what do you need to do in the meantime? While you're continuing to do what God's called you to do, you're continuing to listen for his guidance as to your personal mission. You're following the Holy Spirit as he leads you daily, as you become part of the church and use your spiritual gifts and outreach and service to the Lord. What do you do in the meantime? Well, he says it. As we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. That's everyone. Everyone in our community and in our world. And then he says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so we have outreach, doing good to everyone, and we have inreach, those who are of the household of faith. And we begin to minister and serve and help those who are in need, looking for those opportunities where we can do something. Listen, what's that mean? It means quite simply this. You can't do everything. But you can do something. Amen? So we need discernment. We need to be led by the Spirit of God to decide what is the most important thing He, as, a, as God, has called us as a church to do during this coming year. And that's why we're having this Parkview Dreams on each Sunday night in the month of January. Because we're going to sort out what's important and what isn't. And maybe we need to give, give some of our ministries and programs a good burial. And say, we're just not doing that anymore. The Holy Spirit doesn't want us to do that anymore. It may be that the Holy Spirit is raising up a whole new ministry right in our midst. And God's laid that on somebody's heart. And it needs to be shared. That's what Sunday nights are this, this month. That's why we need you to be a part of it. That's why you're important. Because remember, um, they said uh, to Jesus, hey, tell your followers to stop saying those things about you. And Jesus said what? If they didn't say it, even the rocks would cry out, right? Well, you're just a bunch of rocks. I'm sorry. That's why you need you there on Sunday nights. Because even the rocks cry out. God, God is speaking to you in some way. Have you been listening? Has he been burdening you with something? We need to hear that as a church. Staff needs to hear that. Some people have this idea that staff is, is some magic uh, or magic magicians or something. We just go twink and these little stardust falls and all these things happen it doesn't happen that way we're just part of the assembly of god too we're, we're just one part of it god's gifted me in certain ways and god's gifted other staff members in certain ways and he's gifted you in certain ways but we're all under the guidance and the lordship of jesus christ and we all need to be listening to his spirit as to where the spirit is leading us as a church now we have different ideas we have different goals we know he wants us to serve and minister. That's one of the five basic purposes. So we cast that out. This is what we're going to do this year. We have a verse that kind of guides us and directs us. And now we have a motto. Notice what the motto is. Life is short. Make a difference. Life is short. Make a difference. You say, well, where did you get that? I got that from an article title written by Thomas Rainier. And he was saying the same thing. You know, it's important you start doing something. Because the world's not waiting. The world's going to hell. And, and life is short. Mario's cousin passed away shortly after he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. He had a long anticipated future, but they had the crash of the airplane or helicopter and he died. Life is short. We have certain opportunities God gives to us. That's why we need to make a difference right now. That's why we need to do what God has called us to do right now. So what's our objective? 
embrace the vision of a better world made possible by a church that's making a difference in the world. We, don't, we aren't able to do everything, but we can make a difference in our world. We can do something to change our community and change this world around us if we do what God has called us to do. So what are our goals? How are we going to accomplish that? What are we going to do? Jesus had his specific ideas of what he was going to do to fulfill his overall vision of seeking and saving the lost. So our goals, how will we make a difference in, first of all, our community? How will we make a difference in our city? How will we make a difference in our world? In other words, how, how will we work right here in our neighborhood, our community, our local Stephen Foster neighborhood community? How will we make a difference there? What about the city of Gainesville and Alachua County? How will we make a difference there? What about the extended world, the state of Florida, the United States, North America, around the globe? How will we make a difference there? We need to dream about those things. We need to think about those things. And, and notice we didn't put anything here specifically. We've done that in the past. We didn't do that this year. Why? Because Sunday nights are Parkview dreams. And that's vision nights. Ways in which you can come and help us to dream what God wants us to do as a church. And we can listen to the Spirit together and begin to make plans for what God wants us to do in the coming days. And tonight we're focusing on Bible study and discipleship. We're focusing on evangelism, outreach, and inreach. Those are all areas that we're going to concentrate on and see where we're, what we're doing well, what we're not doing well in, and then how we can do better and what we should do even more so, and what we should dream of doing we haven't even thought of before. That's why we invite you to come and be a part of Parkview Dreams on Sunday nights. There's this wonderful writer named Frederick Buckner, and he has all kinds of great statements. And, and I love this statement. It's become very popular. The statement goes like this. The place God calls, to which God calls you, is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. How do you know what God wants you to do? What is it that thrills your heart, that excites you, gives you great passion and desire? And ask yourself, is the world hungry for that? And when your deep gladness meets the world's need, that's what God's calling you to. So I just leave that out there for you to think about. I leave that out there for our church to think about as we go through this Parkview Dreams each and every Sunday night. I hope you'll be with us tonight at 5 p.m. I hope you'll join with us to dream dreams together and see God's vision for us, God's mission for us in 2017. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, our prayer is that each one of us will discover what you have for us your call upon our lives. Lord, you've given us generalities. You've given us the overall mission of the church. You've given us spiritual gifts. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. Now our prayer is that you'll give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, what the Spirit is saying to our church, what the Spirit is saying to us personally. Lord, our prayer is that each one of us today will not just rededicate ourselves that we will humble ourselves before you and submit ourselves to you and say, speak, Lord, for your servant listens. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing as we close this morning. God is speaking to you. You come as we sing. <laughs>